so there's violence continuing to be perpetuated by national governments and even by corporations who are making money on preparing for and waging wars. There's also, uh, as another potential crisis, unjust economics. And then I think finally, the unbridled power and control of resources by corporations and the wealthiest of the wealthiest. But I would say these aren't really crises as much as they are consequences of human inaction. They are not really the root causes. So these are the effects of what is the real crisis. Dear brothers and sisters, my warmest welcome to the Heart Podcast, Creativity in Crisis. My name is Dr. Glenn T. Martin. These series of podcasts have been created in honor of my newest book called The Earth Constitution Solution Designed for a Living Planet. For a number of years, I've been president of the World Constitution and Parliament Association, an organization working to address our planetary crises and to establish an enduring and liberating human future. I am also a philosopher by profession who loves thinking, creative vision, and inspiring ideas. In these podcasts, I engage in dialogue with prominent thinkers, scholars, and activists who are similarly concerned about the multitude of crises confronting humanity. Are there creative and practical solutions, and how can these be achieved? I hope our listeners will both stay with us and join us in the thought processes that have become an utterly necessary part of our quest to create a decent planetary civilization for everyone. My Creativity in Crisis partner today is David Gollop Esquire. David Gollop is a lawyer who specializes in human rights and world citizenship and world law education. He's president and general counsel of the World Service Authority in Washington, D.C., a global public service human rights organization that was founded in 1954. He is also a member of the Citizens for Global Solutions and team leader of their Peace and Youth Outreach Program. And he is convener of the World Court of Human Rights Coalition. He's been interviewed by major media such as BBC, New York Times, and Huffington Post. And uh, he got his uh, law degree from Washington, D.C., the Washington College of Law, 1992, and his A.B. in French and A.B. in History from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome, David Gullup, to Creativity and Crisis. I've been working at the organization that Gary Davis founded in 1954 for myself for about the last 30 years. Um, Gary Davis died in 2013, so I've, I've been tasked to basically take his legacy and move us forward here into the 21st century. And I don't think Gary Davis would have even founded this organization if he hadn't realized that the world, even back in the 1950s or certainly in the 1940s, when uh, he was a bomber pilot in World War II. You know, if, if he hadn't realized that the world was already in crisis, yeah. And I know that the the title of the show is "Crisis creativity and Creativity," and right? right? So it's it's dealing with both the, the the problem side and then maybe the solution side. So I was thinking about this uh, idea of crisis, and of course, having read your books, both uh, the Earth Constitution for the Federation of the Earth and and the Earth Constitution Solution, I know you've written a lot of other books besides those two, but those two most recently, uh, uh-huh. for, for, for me having read, you know, you present the creativity side as well as the, the, the crisis. In my mind, though, we could talk about crisis in the normal way that many people are the sort of standard way, which would be to say that there is human and planetary health crises like uh, disease or the, the most recent pandemic, obviously. Yeah. There is climate destruction that's been going on basically since the Industrial Revolution, but maybe only in the last 40 or 50 years have we started to, you know, since the Silent silent Spring was written, started to realize uh, how impactful in a negative way human activity is to the planet. So that's, you can see that as a crisis. You could see certainly um, the idea of injustice and the way many people are treated either by their own local, you know, national governments or how people, groups of people treat other groups of people. So there's an injustice there. There's lawlessness. Uh, both locally all the way through through globally, but certainly mm-hmm. at the global level, the lawlessness, which leads to violence, is a major crisis uh, for the existence of humanity, especially in the nuclear age. 
When you say lawlessness, do you mean terrorist activity or criminal activity? Well, yeah. so I look at lawlessness from a bigger perspective. I mean, there's always going to be lawlessness, e even locally. This is why we have locally a court system, a, a judicial system, right. just hopefully a justice uh, system or a criminal law system, if not a, necessarily a criminal justice system, because there right. may not be that much justice in the, in the criminal law system. But yes, that that's going to go on because th that's just happens. And, and you know, humans are, <laughs> are humans and, and we have good sides right. and bad sides to, to ourselves. So this is why we have it. But we don't have that protection against lawlessness or to deal with lawlessness at the highest level, at the world level. Yeah. Uh, so there's the, the violence, you know, is continuing to perpetuated by national governments and even by corporations who are making money on preparing for and waging wars. There's also, uh, as another potential crisis, unjust economics. And then I think finally, the unbridled power and control of resources by corporations and the wealthiest of the wealthiest. So now I've sort of outlined what probably also your previous guests on this show have mentioned is some of the major crises that we're dealing with. But I would say these aren't really crises as much as they are consequences of human inaction. They are not really the root causes. So these are the effects of what is the real crisis. And so what I would, in answer to your question about, you know, crises and, and uh, crises and where we are, I would say the real crises or uh, crisis is humanity has allowed anarchy, violence, and greed to rule our world. Our world has no brain. And I, I, I when I was just rereading oh, some of your book yesterday, at the end of, <laughs> of chapter one of the Earth Constitution yeah. Solution, you talk about the Earth uh, or the new sphere not having a brain. And for me, I mean, that's something that Gary, I learned very early on when starting to work with Gary Davis is that uh, we need to have a brain for the world. A world government would be the brain for the yeah, world. Excellent. It would then I, I allow like us to, to help us deal with our interactions with each other and sustainably with the Earth. So that's the real crisis, is not having that brain. That's, that's interesting. Uh, it, um, some of the people talk about a spiritual crisis, but this is like a little bit different than that, because in uh, Bob Flax, for example, talked about a psychological crisis. He's a psychologist, but it seems unique from that, too. Not having a brain where we're all capable of thinking, we're all capable of having a physical brain, I guess you're suggesting that there's a societal brain or a social brain that is missing. Does it exist within nation states, but not at the world level? Is that what you're saying? I think it does exist, but it also is ineffective because we don't have that higher level uh -huh. identity and uh, governing structure. So one of the things I've started talking about more recently when I talk to students and, and the, the global public is to talk about an ethical identity and an ethical uh, governing structure. So the ethical identity in my mind is would be world citizenship, that that is inclusive, whereas at the national level, that uh, citizenship is exclusive. So we, we want something that's inclusive of everybody, uh, right? As well as the other beings that we're living on the planet with. So it needs to be inclusive. But in our governing structures, they can't be as effective as they could be if there were a higher level brain, like you said, a, a societal brain for all of all of the earth. Uh, yeah. which would uh, make sure to protect every individual as a microcosm of the macrocosm, as well as the earth itself. And I think mm -hmm. that's what the why the earth constitution is really the one of the main solutions to this problem, because it develops the different institutions and structures that would bring in even psychological, spiritual, and emotional intelligence that the world as a whole we have it. We just haven't realized it. I, as, yeah. a, as a universal rights lawyer, I always think about when we discover our rights. We're like on the H and C's when you're, you know, looking for treasure. You know, uh, uh -huh. where you discover, oh, look at this thing that we found. In a sense, when we discover that we have certain rights, then then from then on, we're like, oh, how come we didn't know that before? I mean, just as a quick example, the idea of uh, marriage equality, uh, at least here in America, United States, that. It was a really uh, controversial issue for many, many years. And then all of a sudden, the Supreme Court said, yes, you know, yeah. everyone has the right yeah. to, to be married to consenting adults. And then everyone accepts it. So we discover our rights as we move along. And I think we are, as humans, and what I love about the work that the Earth uh, Constitution Organization is doing is to bring this awareness to everybody through education, through information, through all the amazing meetings that you've had way back since yeah. the, the 50s and 60s to yeah. develop this this creative framework to help us to deal with the, yeah, the crisis. Yeah. One of the arguments that I make 
about the Earth Constitution is, you know, people say, well, another level of government, won't it just be more corruption, more corrupt, bad government, and so on. But the Earth Constitution, even though it's not a philosophical document, I've argued that it's based on human dignity, right, and human rights, universal human rights. It, they're listed in two of the uh, articles and so on. My argument is if you start out from the premise of human dignity, right, it's all-inclusive. Never before in history has it ever been all-inclusive. Then what you're going to get is, in your phrase, which I like very much, ethical governing structures, right, emerging. Uh, whereas w within nations, for example, you know, there's all this talk, as you know, about the United States preserving its democracy since uh, January 6th and uh, the need for democratic voting rights and reestablishing our de democracy and protecting it. Which is a very good thing. It's, I think, because, you know, democracy is a foundation for all these things, uh, for good governance, good human rights and so on. But in its foreign policy, there's no democracy. In its foreign policy, there's murder, there's, there's, uh, killer drones, there's assassination squads, there's sanctions against other nations. There's hostility, there's nuclear weapons development. It is a shame. And I think this really, tell me if I'm wrong or not, but this kind of illustrates what you're talking about, that if we have a certain democratic brain within the country, within any country, really, it, the fact that there's no brain for the earth, there's no governing structure for the earth, makes that break down on a global level. I completely agree with you, Glenn. I would say that the, the term foreign policy is actually an oxymoron. How can you have a policy between equally sovereign states who are willing to wage war as a final resolution to conflict? Yeah. That is not policy. That's anarchy. <laughs> yeah. 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 And going all the way back to Thomas Hobbes, you know, uh, who, who said that peace comes through law internally in a country. But he said the nations, between the nations, they confront one another as gladiators, he said. There's, there's no law between nations. And, you know, and people have recognized this lawlessness of the world system. Yeah. Um, we have to have that higher level beyond the states because then if each of the states are working in a partial or just a limited way to resolve some cause of human activity like global destruction or climate destruction, that's not enough. We have to work together as one human family to resolve that, because if one part of the world continues its emissions and pollution, then whatever somebody else might do in a small way in another part of the world won't really have enough impact to counteract that. So yeah. unless we're working together, I mean, united we stand, divided we fall. Yeah. Um, yeah. The principles of, of, of democratic revolutions still stand true today, even if they're not effectively being implemented. I mean, I think if you spoke to some of the founders, whether it were of the United States of America, like Ben Franklin or, or Thomas Paine, or you speak to some of the, the founders of the European Union, for example, where they wanted to create that union to prevent war ever happening again in Western Europe, you would see that these individuals knew that it can't just stay at this local or even regional level. We really need to move beyond it. In fact, most uh -huh. of these people consider themselves citizens of the world. But like you effectively mentioned in the Earth Constitution Solution, Unless we really add the institutions of law or government along with its corollary citizenship, neither will be effective. So both have to come together, both the identity and the governing ethical yeah. government structures. Yeah. We're, we're all human beings. The world is our WCPA supporters in India always say, Vaishudaiva Kudumbakam, the world is one family. Yeah, it comes from the Upanishad. And your thesis, I guess, your argument that I think it very strong is there's something about our social nature as human beings, our common dignity as human beings, that if we were to take that social nature and organize it in government, this would address the litany of problems that you reviewed at the beginning of our discussion. Yeah. I mean, when I speak to students about citizenship and then how that's linked to its corollary government there you could see citizenship in one way which would be like when you drop a pebble into a, a still pond or lake it creates ripples or concentric circles so you can be a citizen of your family and then of your city and then of your region of your hemisphere of the whole earth of the milky way galaxy of the universe of the multiverse yeah. if there is such yeah. a thing right yeah. all of those 
Or you can even look at citizenship as multiple, say, raindrops that just start falling on a still pond that make multiple overlapping concentric circles, sort of like a Venn diagram, and that you can be a citizen in all those different groups. You could be a citizen of your book club. You could be a citizen of the organization uh-huh. that you work for. You could be a citizen of, you know, as well as of your family and of your community all at the same time. But once again, unless we are linking all of those identities to a higher level structure that will help us to interact peacefully, then there's going to be breakdown in society, even in family. You have to have participation and you might say buy-in if you want to talk about it in, a, in an economic way to how we, in a sense, govern. I mean, are we going to govern by the rule of law and a democratic participatory process? Or are we going to rule by force and uh, by brute power? And that's a no, choice we, that humans are making every day. No. And we need to help uh, humans through education move towards the love, the love and the idea of working together in a holistic and ethical way. And I, and I really do think that your, your books are, are ph- philosophical. You're, you're a, ph- a philosophy professor. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. and I mean, one of the tenets of philosophy is to determine why are we here? Why are humans yeah. here? What, what are, what are we doing? What's our existence about? And if our existence isn't about uh, loving and living together peacefully and making a wonderful world for ourselves and for the earth itself, then what, it's all, what is it all about? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's interesting, this, the concept of citizenship is interesting because we identify with other people. We're not just a member of the human family, but a citizen is defined under law. That's right. right? It, it's something that... Uh, I may be a private person, uh, but at the same time, if I have uh, public interactions, I appeal to my rights as a citizen, my my duties as a citizen, and so on. Uh, so citizenship comes with law, and there's kind of a big lack there, you know. And I've I've tried to point this out sometimes in my writings. Uh, there's all these movements for world citizenship, you know, people identifying as world citizens. And I, I argue that that's really not enough because if I say I'm a world citizen, it becomes a kind of moral claim or a kind of personal identity claim, but it's not a legally justified and empowered claim. We really need a democratic world government to make that legally justified and empowered. I would disagree with you a little bit. I would say that so the word citizen, you're right, refers to rights and duties of an individual or a group of people within yeah. a particular community. When yeah. you add world in front of citizen, you're saying that those rights and duties are global or maybe even universal, right? Yeah. That wherever yeah. we find ourselves on planet Earth, our rights and duties should be respected. In fact, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that all national governments, at least that are member states of the UN, have agreed to respect yeah. these universal rights. If they don't, they give lip service to them, but on a day-to-day basis, many of those governments violate. Right. But right. that doesn't mean that the term world citizen or claiming that isn't, cannot be or is not already a valid legal and, and official status. Because where does citizenship usually under law come from? Well, it comes from, you know, just people wanting to see themselves as a community and to work together, obviously. But that's sort of on a philosophical plane or maybe just an actual action plane. But on the plane of Law, it comes from usually two legal principles, use soli and use sanguinis. So the right of the earth and the right of the blood, you might say, or the right of heredity. So, so in a nation state, for example, and, and some countries choose one, the right of the earth, and, one, and some choose the right of the blood, meaning if you were born on the land in a particular place, you are a citizen of that country. But there are some places in the world where just because you were born there doesn't mean you're a citizen there. Uh, yeah. You have to have parents or even grandparents who are citizens there. Uh, uh, and there's people like the Rohingya refugees who have been born for generations in Myanmar, Burma, who are stateless because the government doesn't want to give them the citizenship, which is ridiculous. They are citizens already of the world, so they have universal rights and duties. They're right, just right. not being respected right. by the local government. So then when I, so the final point of this is when you add world in front of citizen, under the principles of use soli and use sanguinis, all human beings are first, we're born on planet Earth, so that makes us legally world citizens. That's yeah. the land. And we're all born of human parents, at least as far as I'm aware. So yeah. because our heredity, our bloodline is homo sapien, right? Yeah. Our genus and species, 
that also makes us citizens by our heritage. So uh -huh. really legally, and this is this is one of the things I think that that is amazing about what Gary Davis did, maybe not even knowing what he was doing as he claimed world citizenship after having given up. He loved the United States, but he had to give that up to get right. out of the war system. And is to say that we can be this, that it is valid and legitimate even now. But you're right to make it fully effective. So it's like you might say it's partially effective. It's a, it's, it's a if you can say this, it's almost like a partial legal status because we don't have the institutions like a world parliament that's right, democratically right. and participatorily, you know, created and elected and run yet to legally affirm that. So my status as a, cause I claim to be a world citizen, Gary Davis did, although I, I didn't yeah, give up. And my, I do too. I, yeah. I didn't give up my local status to do that. Gary did, but he did that in the sense yeah. to say, well, no one else has to. I've done it. I've created that higher level allegiance where, where there was nothing. It was an empty space in a sense. Now that I've done it, everybody just has to claim that higher level allegiance. It is valid. It is legal. And World Service Authority, which you may not know this, one of the things we do is we have a legal department. And that was the reason why I came to WSA back in 1992, to help give legal backing for people to represent themselves legally, officially, and politically as world citizens. So every yeah. day we have oh, uh, law students and lawyers uh, who help us to draft legal briefs, legal letters to help people to either, whether it's to exercise their right to identity, exercise their right to travel, uh, exercise their right to stay in a, in a safe place if they fled, a place where they're being persecuted. And all that's affirming, you might say, the universal principles and, and rights and, and duties that should always be being met. And we've had great success over the years through our amicus curiae, front of the court briefs, through our legal letters and petitions to government officials to expose violations of rights and demand redress for individuals as world citizens. This is very interesting and exciting to me because you're what you're doing, I think you actively are doing, is creating this groundwork in which law is law is rising, law is becoming more powerful. World law is exactly. arising from the grassroots, so to speak, and forming these networks of concepts and these networks of identities and rights using the UN Universal Declaration and the Earth Charter and so on. And that would make me rethink a kind of juxtaposition that I've sometimes made between, say, the Earth Charter and the uh, Earth Constitution, or even the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Articles 12 and 13 of the Earth Constitution. You know, because, you know, I've said that on the one hand, the Earth Charter is a beautiful ideal. It's a beautiful document, but it's just an ideal, right? That what the Earth Constitution does is create law, effective world law, based on our common human dignity and so on, and embody it in a process by which human beings can actually protect, implement, extend, actually operate with world law, right? And uh, But both the Earth Charter and the Earth Constitution, if I understand what you're saying, are also elements in an emerging force that has many, many directions, many, many links to other things, a kind of synergy that, that's bringing world law to the fore. I, and I like that very much, that yeah, idea. I, yeah, I, I really think that the Earth Constitution is crucial for the survival of humanity and the Earth. I mean, there's maybe other options to get us to a, a peaceful situation in, in the world. But I feel like the work that I'm doing here, the work that you're, you've been doing for for many decades to continue the work of Philip Isley uh, that he started uh, to develop the Earth Constitution is so crucial because if we don't implement this pretty much immediately, we're, I'm afraid that we're goners. We, you know, that they, yeah, yeah. That, uh, everything that we've built up in society will completely fall apart w without the guidance that we need from a structure and institution that the Earth Constitution provides. And like I said, it may not be the only pathway to peace. But we need to start choosing those pathways and moving immediately forward. Yeah, we can't, yeah. We can't, I mean, this is why Gary Davis basically did that bold action to to give up his U.S. citizenship because he he, he wanted to really raise dramatic awareness. And I would yeah. rather us come to world citizenship and the Earth Constitution not because we're forced to by total climate breakdown or by a nuclear war. It doesn't make sense right. to wait for right. that event that forces us right. into the position of changing right. how we deal with each other in the earth. Yeah. No, we, we need to do this now.
I, I'm no. totally on board. And I can't wait to see how we can work together to promote oh, that's, the Constitution that's exciting. and world yeah. citizenship as part of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. People say the Earth Constitution is one path and there might be other paths. And indeed, that's true on a theoretical level. The way I put it is that uh, I have this sense of crisis, right? Since uh, since I was a, I'm a little bit older than you, since I was a young boy and they made me hide under my desk because of the possibility of nuclear war, I, I realized that there's something really absurd about living life under this threat of possible Holocaust where everybody would be wiped out. It's just, it's just absurd. So we have to start making choices. You know, even though there might be other options, uh, I know a lot of potential constitutions have been written for the earth. This one is beautiful. It's powerful. It's widespread. It's translated into many languages and it has a whole organization behind it. And so I choose this one, not because there's uh, some perfect or right way to do it, but because we're facing these crises, we need to make decisions, you know, and, uh, and I'm so delighted to hear you say, you know, that you, uh, you agree and you'd like to work with us, you know, oh, I'm definitely. very excited about that. Yeah. I mean, and what's been exciting for me over the past almost a year now is that I've seen different groups of individuals, whether they consider themselves uh, world constitutionalists or world federalists or world citizens, or even people uh, who are outside of those movements, but in the peace and justice movements, the environmental movements, start coming together and, and seeing that we, you're not going to have peace. You're not going to have justice. You're not going to have environmental sustainability. You're not going to prevent uh, war or, or outlaw it uh, or re-outlaw it, since there's already it was sort of outlawed, I guess you could say, with the kellogg Brown Pact. But unless we bring all of those movements together, we need to come out of our silos no. uh, and no. start working as one. And I know you and your colleague Lucio are working to help us to, and we're working with you to do that. There's other, there's like at least two or three other groups. There's Young World Federalists that we're, we're working with, Democracia Global and others that we're working with to really say we can no longer stay in the movement in a sense, the, the, the world unity movement, if you want to give it a, a larger title, separate. If we're separate, yeah. how are, are we ever going to unite yeah. everybody, you know, on the planet unless we start working together? Yeah, and I've been, you know, uh, you may know that Philip Isley was very kind of elitist, and he wouldn't have anything to do with uh, other organizations that didn't affirm the Constitution. But since I've been, since 2003, when they made me Secretary General at the time, I've been wanting to build coalitions and bridges, but uh, there are dangers. And we discuss this, uh, executive council meetings, this kind of thing all the time in that we want to build coalitions, but if there's world federalist groups that take away from this sense of urgency and this need to look at this constitution and get it ratified, then we're diluting our energy and it's being distracted. Even though they are world federalists in theory, we don't have a hundred years to, to create a world government. So we, we work as much as possible with others, you know, but we don't want to lose our focus on the Earth Constitution. Oh, definitely no. I mean, you're the, you're the, your organization is the principal proponent of that Constitution. And you, yeah. That's your mission, right? Yeah, you that's have right. to do that. Yeah. One of the things that we're working on that, that we had started working on, in fact, it was founded back in 1974 in a, in more in a, uh, draft way, but creating a world court of human and now environmental rights, which is actually already part of the Earth Constitution, but we've been trying to work at it now I've been working with a lawyer up in Burlington, Vermont, and we've had some events in Canada here in the U.S. with the Canadian and American Bar Associations to promote that court. But there's still great pushback, even for that, you might say, in a tripartite, if there's going to be such a thing, world government, the the judicial side is, is extremely important. Maybe not as important as the parliamentarian side of it, but it's still important so that if someone is agreed, they can find some justice in, in a justice system. But there's pushback against that. Yeah. doesn't mean I'm not promoting it on right. a day-to-day -day basis right. and trying to right. get supporters such as your organization and others and like Citizens for Global what? Solutions and the Wells and World Federalist Movement yeah. towards that. But it's not, you're right, it's not easy. People have their hobby horse or their their right. their particular focus, which is good because you then are, are an expert in the, the Earth Constitution. I am not yet, uh, but one day I really hope to be a better expert. But I am, I feel like, an expert in law or world law and right. in world citizenship. I feel like that's something that, that I'm good at in explaining 
uh, helping students, especially uh, and young people, get what this means. Because if we don't get them involved, where are we? Yeah, <laughs> we have to. Um, yeah. You know, I have an idea for you, a proposition for you. Uh, you. You may know that we have the 15th session of the Provisional World Parliament coming up, scheduled for New Delhi in December, December 10th through 12th. What the Provisional World Parliament does is looks at uh, pre-written drafts of bills for world legislative acts. And you also may know that in 2014, one of our world legislative acts was empowering a collegium of world judges. And this is called for in Article 9 of the Earth Constitution. So what we are trying to do is get uh, retired judges, highly qualified people to identify with this collegium so that when we do activate the first bench of the world Supreme Court system, there are these qualified people who can do it maybe beginning on a, the provisional world court level and so on. And I'm thinking that you could write a uh, bill or a proposal that could be submitted to the parliament uh, about the courts of human rights and the work you've been doing and so on and integrated some way with our work in the Collegium of World Judges. And so it might be a very powerful uh, synergy there between all the work you've been doing and the statements. Uh, and they, they will be, I think, very historically significant uh, in this December because we have a large organization, a lot of media behind it. People will be looking at this session of the Provisional World Parliament. So I, I invite you to, to consider that. Write something about the World Court of Human Rights, and we can see if we could integrate it into the decisions of the parliament. I love that idea, Glenn. That, that makes me very happy, and, and uh, it makes sense to do that. And I'm fairly certain that you did meet Mark Ottinger, who was the attorney that we yes. sent back in 2013, 14, 15, I think it was, yes. to Lucknow uh, Chief Justice Conferences. And there was one of the conferences, I can't remember whether now it was 2014 or 2015, where all the chief justices who were in attendance did themselves separately make a final declaration that, that that did agree to the fact that there should be a world court of human rights. And then stepping back to sort of play the devil's advocate here, I would say, well, by creating a world court of, say, human and environmental rights now, are we doing a partial effort? You know, is that going to take away from the full effort, which would be this Earth Constitution? Maybe it would be. I mean, just like there's other people working to create a UN parliamentary assembly, which would then maybe lead into an actual people's assembly and then maybe replace the UN. You know, you're right. Do we want to do things in a step by step way? And that's always been so many arguments that's been supported by many world federalists. Or do we do want to make some kind of big leap, a big leap towards the Earth Constitution and world citizenship as, as a fully vested rights and duty status for every human being? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think we need to try to be doing Got both it. at the Got same it. time. They, I mean, they, once again, you both. Both. <laughs> Why not? But well, um, we got to have the big leap. Yes. Without the big leap, I don't see there is a future. The lower leap's working, right? Exactly. <laughs> and they take too long to do. But, uh, Exa exactly. but there's a synergy there that, that, can, that can help bring everything together, I think. To our listeners, I hope you have enjoyed today's dialogue about establishing a living future for the Earth and for all future generations. Our podcast has been recorded, and the link will be streamed to multiple social media outlets and posted on my own website at oneworldrenaissance.com. I would love to hear your thoughts and reactions to this exciting conversation. You can email me at gmartin at earthconstitution.world. This podcast has been made in association with Everscope Multimedia. Thank you all so much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, and that you will join us in creativity and crisis at the same time and place next week. Goodbye for now, be well, and God bless.